Here's Sirius. Not here. Anyway, I'd just like to thank Sirius, even though he's not here. I'd like to thank him for all the hard work uh, putting this uh, event together, and especially the wonderful catering. And I think that's why people are not here. They're downstairs <laughs> finishing their tea. Anyway, we're going to make a start because we're on the last leg of this amazing journey. And um, wow, we've had um, a real range of papers today. And I think you'll agree, really, um, so many different things to think about. Uh, we could probably sit here for another couple of days at least and, and carry on, couldn't we? Anyway, no, maybe not. Okay, I'm really, um, really happy to introduce the first of our two speakers for the panel number three. Um, Dr. William Southworth, who actually really needs no introduction. <laughs> He's an old friend, um, an alumni of, uh, of uh, SOAS. Um, he told me he took 10 years, was it, with your PhD? Well, those are the days. Um, anyway, curator of Southeast Asian Art, Rijksmuseum, Amsterdam. Um, and William, as I've said here, well, he originally graduated from Hull University uh, with an MA in Art and Archaeology at SOAS um, and, and the Institute of Archaeology in London. And his doctorate was on the early Champa culture of central Vietnam, uh, which he completed in 2001. And he became a fellow of the Center for Khmer Studies in Siem Reap um, and also at the International Institute of Asian Studies in Leiden. Uh, he's a contributor to this research project, um, the Corpus of Inscriptions of Champa at the uh, FAO. And uh, he's currently curator at the Rijksmuseum. Um, and his paper now is titled The Provenance History of the Stone Sculptures from Central Java in the Rijksmuseum, Amsterdam. Thank you. Hello. Uh, sadly, I haven't speeded up in the last years, so uh, hopefully I will be able to get through most of this talk. Um, but it's a little bit different in the sense that I'll be looking in particular at just one specific collection in the Rijksmuseum. Um, and really just giving you an overview of the whole collection uh, without trying to get too much into individual objects. Uh, I will fail in that because uh, sometimes we know a bit more, but um, yeah, the intent is to give you an overview. Uh, I, I, this is just, I think you know, you know the uh, Java. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of the collection. Um, by central Java, I really mean the area around Mount Merapi, uh, Prambanan, uh, Borobudur, but I will also include one sculpture from Chandisuku, uh, which is further to the east, uh, but just to, um, for the sake of inclusivity. Um, the collection consists, this is the collection of stone sculptures from central Java, and it consists of 24 objects. Um, sometimes people assume that we have kind of thousands uh, of which um, only a few are on show, but actually we, we're almost, we can almost show 50% of the collection. Um, but it's actually one of the collections where uh, the questions of provenance and restitution come up very frequently. So that's why I chose this. Of the 24 objects, only one is actually owned by the Rijksmuseum. Um, the others, 23, are on long-term loan from a private society, which is the Koninklijke Vereniging van Vrienden der Asiatische Kunst, which is, uh, their English name is Royal Asian Art Society in the Netherlands. And this was founded um, in 1918 um, the Koenigklijke, that's the royal uh, designation, was only granted on their 100th anniversary in, uh, in 2018, so uh, quite recently. Uh, but this society was founded uh, specifically by uh, private individuals, often uh, bankers, people in the financial sector, lawyers, uh, who were interested in Asian art. And I should say that the bulk of the collection is actually Chinese and Japanese art. So um, the smallest collections are in fact, Southeast Asia and South Asia. 
for Javanese material, the most important person uh, is actually the first chairman of the society, a man called Herman Carell Westendorp, uh, who was a banker, uh, and his wife, Betsy Westendorp Ozik. And a lot of the pieces that I'll be showing were actually um, collected by him or bought by him or arranged uh, for transfer by him. <clears throat> and his wife uh, often gave uh, aesthetic advice. So she was uh, an artist herself, uh, and I think he took her, her views quite seriously. The first, the first four uh, were all acquired by Westendorp. Uh, the one top left is the first piece, uh, and it was bought in 1919 in a sale in Amsterdam. Uh, there's an auctioneer's F. Muller, uh, and that was the first piece acquired. He bought it for himself and he donated it to the society in 1924. <coughs> the two pieces in the center, Nandishra and Mahakala, uh, were bought from a Dutch, a Dutch nobleman, the, <coughs> the young Herr van Halter, uh, who was living in Paris in 1928. So he bought it uh, from him in 1928. And these, these kind of acquisitions are also actually quite typical of the society. Um, we don't have anything actually that was bought on the international art market. They were all bought really from um, usually Dutch collectors who were known to have something of interest. Um, and in many cases, uh, yeah, the actual origin, when, when the piece came to the Netherlands, when it was first acquired is simply not known and our uh, information runs out. Um, this would be a very boring talk if that was true of <laughs> all of the pieces. Uh, but in 1930, uh, Westendor went to Java for the specific purpose of acquiring Javanese uh, sculpture. Um, and it was part of a big Asian trip where uh, the society managed to gather uh, a huge amount of funding at the time uh, to acquire objects. And in China and Japan, uh, they went to dealers and bought objects that way. Uh, but in Java, it was a little bit more complicated. The little, the Ganesha, he bought at an Indonesian art market uh, in Yogyakarta in 1930. And it's about, yeah, a little bit over 40 centimeters high. And I think that this must be uh, the kind of maximum that you could actually acquire uh, legally in Java at the time. Uh, so small statues, but nothing, nothing bigger than that. Um, more importantly, and this is a little bit, uh, yeah, more importantly, he, he was the, the society was very well connected, not only in the Netherlands uh, with figures in government and uh, other government institutions, but it was also very well connected internationally. And it had very good relations. Um, it established good relations with the archaeological service of the Dutch East Indies, Audit Kundigadienst. Um, and at the time they were busy uh, with a restoration program, especially of the temple of Chandilara Jongrang, but of other temples in the Prambanan area. And this is one of the small temples, and you can see oh, uh, the OD 1932 is the Audi Kundigadienst uh, and their work. Um, unfortunately, in the late 1920s, the uh, you had the stock market crash and commodities from the Dutch East Indies really dropped in value. So the local government, which funded um, most of the archaeological services work, was hugely short of money. And <clears throat> all but the most essential restoration work was put on hold. And this was problematic because they collected a huge number of sculptures, um, some of which they had clear plans to restore to the temples, but others which they had, uh, which, yeah, 
that they couldn't really see any uh, chance of being able to restore in the future. So they wanted a home for the sculptures where they would be preserved. Most of them were being kept outside in a temporary storage around the Prambanan. Uh, but also they wanted to show it to a Dutch audience to encourage, uh, especially from um, uh, people connected to government, to encourage support for the restoration program as a whole. I think that was the main intent. And the result of this was that the Audit uh, Kungadins gave or lent 12 objects from their uh, collections in, in storage to the society. Oops. And these are really the most important, uh, seven of the most important. And what is good about these from the point of view of the archaeology is that we know where they're from because the Audet Kunigadinst knew exactly where they had come from. Um, so the first three uh, are from uh, Chandilara Jongrang. The one on the left actually isn't. Uh, it's from a, um, a village called uh, Desa Prambanan Kidul, uh, which was actually a site in the rice fields where sculpture had been found, but it's very close to the temple. Uh, the Manjushri, <laughs> uh, we know is from Chandi Pleasan. Um, and the three pieces um, on the right, uh, the big lintel, the Kala lintel is from Chandi Sewu. Uh, and one of the Makaras and the other is from Chandi Bubara, which is a site just south of Chandi Sewu. So all from big, well-known sites uh, in the Prambanan Plain. This one is particularly interesting because we only know it's from Chandi Sewu, not because of the Aude Kronigadins, but because of um, art historical research in the last few years. Uh, and it's clear that this piece uh, was taken, obviously taken from the temple very early, um, before, certainly before 1865, because it appears in the photograph on the right uh, on the far right, is, this is the same sculpture in a collection, the Lichter, Lichter uh, estate. And this was a man who collected pieces from the surrounding areas. It was quite close to Chandi Sewu. Um, but this, this origin had been forgotten. Lichter himself died, it was given to somebody else, and eventually came through to the Audet Kundgadinst in the early 20th century but the actual origin had been, was, was forgotten. Uh, but it clearly comes, this is, this is just the view of the temple, and it clearly comes from the main, the main building. And you have four entrances with two macros on each side, and it's definitely one of these. There's one missing on the east side. Um, and yeah, it's, it was from there. Um, so, the, this lintel, luckily the archive um, material we have uh, within the museum gives you details. Uh, the letters from the Aude Kunigadin specify exactly which of the 240 subsidiary temples this one is from. And it's from one of the first, um, um, yeah, the first row of sub sub subsidiary temples. Um, and this is from this actual uh, um, uh, kind of shrine. So, uh, yeah, really, really good information. And that's because it's linked to the, to the archaeological service. Otherwise, we would have no idea. <coughs> Oops. Ah. In addition to those seven pieces, uh, which were given on loan, and actually that, yeah, reminds me of what I was going to say, um, is that because they're on loan from um, the Audit Kunigadins to the society, and then on loan from the society to the Rijksmuseum, uh, you have a kind of double loan objects. And the question is, well, who, who is actually the owner of the objects? And it's quite possible that the owner, um, well, the owner is basically the legal um, uh, 
de legal opvolger, de uh, legal, uh, succeed, thank you, <laughs> I've forgotten my English, uh, <laughs> but the legal successor of uh, the Audi Congadines, and that could well be the Indonesian Archaeological Service. Uh, so that is something which is actually being investigated now, is to, to determine, uh, yeah, who, who is actually the owner. Um, but five objects were given to the society, I suspect because they, these were not so um, considered so important. Um, but also, yeah, I think they were quite sure that these were not going to be used for restoration. Um, and again, this one is from Chandi Sewu on the top left. Um, this, these, the, the Brahma in the middle and this head are from Chandi Merak. Um, lower right is from Chandi Pleosan. And the top right, we don't actually know. It's the only one we don't know where it's from. And there was something I was going to add here, but I've forgotten. Yeah, for the, in, in the case of Chandi Marak, we also have excavation photos, uh, which show clearly um, uh, the piece in, in context. This was found in September 1925. So you can, with the, the photo, photographic archive of the Audic and Gadins, which is nicely available actually um, from uh, the museum in Leiden, uh, you can actually uh, find, find it quite easily. This piece, um, yeah, is a little bit exceptional. It's one from, uh, it was bought in 1936 uh, from a collector in the Netherlands, um, and this is, um, I have it here, Mr. J.G. Heuser, um, that, I think that's the wrong pronunciation, but um, he was a collector and he also wrote actually quite some quite good articles, uh, mainly on crease and other, uh, other later objects. But he bought this sculpture from a Jonker van Sieperstein, who is this gentleman here, um, and he gave a detailed story uh, of where sculpture was supposed to be from. And according to the story, it was originally in the, yeah, in the house of Deepa Nogoro, who is a hugely important um, hero from the Java Wars in 1825, 1830. He was the leader of that, that uh, of the, of the Japanese rebellion and is a huge hero of modern day Indonesia. And the story goes that it was taken from his house by the commandant J.U. Baron de Salis, and then through him to his son-in-law, the Jonker Dana van Varik, and then to his son, and then to an art dealer, Mr. Turnison. And we've done a lot of this uh, research on this. Actually, there isn't a Baron J.U. de Salis. Uh, the, the Baron at the time was uh, completely in the Netherlands. He was not in Java at all. Um, and also, he was not the father-in-law of Dana van Barak. The father-in-law was actually Baron Melville von Kahn Bay, who is another uh, nobleman with a very extensive record in Java. Um, but the Baron had three sons, all of which had some connection. Uh, they were all in Java at the time, usually with the military or with some aspect of government, often as resident. Um, and there's been lots of speculation of who, which, which one of these people may have owned the sculpture. <laughs> um, and I, okay, I'll flick through this. But the basic, the basic result of this is that actually we have no and none of the information in that story matches. The dates don't match, nothing matches. Uh, so we don't even know that it was ever in the, uh, in the collection of the de Salis family, let alone of Deep Nagoro. And I gave this lecture, I gave a lecture on this at the Muse National Museum in Jakarta um, and actually had a very, very kind audience for that. Um, but it's, this is one of the problems, the fact that I think, I think it's a story from the art dealer Turnison, and I think it's completely made up in the 1920s. Um, very quickly, pieces acquired after 1940, and this includes the head from the Borobudur, which 
uh, was actually bought in, well, it was donated in 1948 by a man called Willy van der Mandela, a, a banker. Uh, but it was previously owned by an art historian, Daniel Francois Chalier, in 19, around 1920. But that's when the trail goes cold. Perhaps I go very quickly to these three fragments. These are all three fragments, supposedly from the Bourbeur, from the relief. Uh, and these are our most embarrassing objects. I, I, I cringe when I see these. Uh, and the one in the middle is actually, uh, is gilded and placed in cotton wool in a wooden surround. And it's a kind of, yeah, you, it would be the perfect object for an exhibition on colonial guilt. <laughs> Uh, and we know that this was actually, it was donated by an aged gentleman who had acquired it from his father. So I suspect it was in the family a long time, uh, but it was clearly embarrassed to have it. And the last one, which is the Kuvera, and very quickly, uh, this one was bought in 1999. It's the, this is the one only piece actually owned by the Rijksmuseum. And you think, well, why, how did they, yeah, this is very risky in 1999. Uh, so why, why did we buy it? And the reason is because it has, uh, not only does it have a photograph from 1923 from the archeological service, but on the right, it has an export certificate, which I've never seen one of these actually before. before. <laughs> You th it's kind of almost a mythical piece of paper, <laughs> but it has, a, it was, um, it's actually signed by uh, the archaeological service, the office of FDK Bosch, but because the, a decision had been made by the governor general to release it uh, for export. But why that was done, I don't actually know. And, but this, we can do a little bit more research. I would love to know what the argument was. It must be a recorded argument for why it was released. Um, so that is, um, yeah, we know it's from Gedong Songo. So that kind of almost covers the entire uh, heritage of central Java. And perhaps in my closing remarks, um, I should say that in a way, I'm kind of totally caught because in a way this is a, is a problematic collection because so many of the objects can be linked to major temples in central Java. Uh, they're all famous, they're all from famous temples. Uh, it's not problematic in the sense of, this is my, with my archeological hat, is that, you, yeah, it's actually, it's all taken from either, um, either through official connections through the archeological service, or it was acquired from people in the Netherlands. Um, and this is one aspect I would like to mention for the fragments is that those fragments were, they were all donated, uh, one in 1972, one in 1985, and one in 1991. And you think, well, why, what, what were the curators thinking when they accepted those? But actually it kind of, it's one of, yeah, it, it, it almost redeems the museum actually because the, the role of the museum is not just to, um, yeah, present new objects for display, but actually to bring to public attention things that are in the private domain. And if we hadn't accepted those, I don't know what actually would have happened to them. Uh, and this is something which often in the debate, it, it's, we start to get actually, as a curator, you start to get rather defensive because <laughs> everybody's thinking, well, you know, all this stuff should go back to Java. Uh, you shouldn't have it, you know, um, but actually I think the museums do have a role um, in actually, yeah, operating in that interface between the public and uh, the private domain and bringing things into, into a, a, a public awareness, which it simply wouldn't have if it just remained in a private collection. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, William. Um, as an ex-museum curator, I can sympathize with a lot of what you're saying. 
there were two things that stand out to, uh, from that uh, very interesting presentation. One was that you mentioned that perhaps the Dutch Archaeological Service actually, <clears throat> presumably it was nationalized when independence happened and therefore this question of the legal successor, I don't know, maybe you could say a little bit about what you know of what happened when you know bodies like that, uh, what happened to their status through nationalization. And then the second one is the, the kind of shenanigans that dealers get up to when they try to authenticate mm. objects. And so if he's making a case that De Ponegoros was the original owner, well, then he needs to have a, um, a, um, a rationale for how it was passed on then from De Ponegoros' hands. Um, you know, but there's no evidence, is there, of how that came to be? No, no. I mean, the, the yes. I'll, I'll deal with that one first, then they okay. can remind me of the first. <laughs> uh, but yeah, in the case of the Deep Nagura one, it was interesting because the, the occasion was um, we had a staff um, which was in private collection in the, in the Baud family. Uh, Baud was a general in the Java War. And um, the family had kept this ever since um, the 1830s. Um, and it was offered, I think, offered to the museum. Uh, and we facilitated its return to Java because there's things belonging that are known to have belonged to Deep Noguro are kind of number one on the list of what um, the authorities in Indonesia want returned. So this is a special case. Um, so this was immediately sensitive. But in that case, we have a, uh, the family had a letter uh, detailing from the 1830s, detailing the circumstances in which they were, it was given to him as the staff of Deep Nagoro. Uh, it was in exactly the right area, the right time. So you have real historical evidence. And it, you can't actually prove, you know, it, people want, you, can you actually prove that this was, well, no, but, but if you have evidence from the period, you know, when you have that historical documentation, you can, you know, say, well, it's 90%, 80%, 98% certain that this was from Deep Nagoro. If you have an art dealer story from the 1820s and uh, 1920s, that's a completely different story. And, uh, and, but there's a lot of, this is, yeah, I mean, basically, if it's passed through the art market, if it's passed through a dealer, then it's, then you, you can't trust the information. And in the past, and, and by in the past, I, I actually mean, even in the early 1980s, there wasn't a great interest in provenance research. You know, people, well, I say people, but often the collectors, the society members, just wanted a good story, you know, and there wasn't the kind of critical attention that there is now. Uh, now it's deeply serious, uh, um, the whole issue of, of uh, constructing the hit biography of objects is a deeply serious matter, but it wasn't even 20, 20 25 years ago. Uh, so yeah, you can't trust anything a dealer tells you. Uh, I say that as an archaeologist, but also a curator. <laughs> but the first, the first part, ah, mm. yes, the pieces on loan. Uh, what, what was the question, actually? Um, what happens What happens during independence to, to ah, the Dutch yeah, archaeological yeah. service, yeah. for example? Yeah, well, it was complicated because in the Second World War, there was a kind of alternative uh, archaeological service set up by the Japanese. Uh, but I... I um, as far as I know, the Indonesian Archaeological Service today sees itself very much as the legal uh, successor of the Dutch Archaeological Service. So it's, it's an integral part of their history, I think. Yeah. Marika. Sorry. Uh, so it's, it's not an alternative. It's, they, 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 it's there was... just a con institutional con uh, continuities across mm -hmm. the war. And... Well, in the, I think, but, but I, I, I mean, you can correct me on this, but I think after, after the war, there was a continuation in the um, Prambanan area of the, of the Indonesian team who had worked on uh, with the Japanese, but the, the Dutch then set up their, uh, re, their re, renewed archaeological service in Batavia, and 
so there's a kind of there's um at a certain point in time you have two organizations but but i think both are seen as as yeah i think the modern archaeological service is seen as a legal success of both and that would would indicate that, that yeah there's a very likely and it would be it would be really nice actually if we can just scrub out on loan from the Arik and the Deans from to on loan from yeah the modern Indonesian organization and and I very yeah very quickly uh, there's the the actual yeah if if that is the case then it's also possible that the original loan agreement is still valid and that is a really interesting agreement because the agreement was these things would be sent on loan are the main objects uh, but if they were required for restoration, they should be given back immediately on the expense of the society for that purpose. But it would then, each piece would need to be replaced by an alternative object of equal aesthetic and monetary value uh, to be displayed in the society. So that you have a kind of, it, it locks you into uh, a kind of reciprocal relationship, which is actually, I think it really, I really like this. This was FDK Bosch uh, and who knew what he was doing. And I, I think this is a really good, uh, actually a very modern way of looking at it. Um, so a kind of eternal um, rotating loan. But it's, yeah, agreement. actually, uh, it, it sounds weird, but but actually, surely yeah. there's a let out clause somewhere. I don't think so. I think it's really solid. But it, but it actually, uh, yeah, it's like almost a kind of yeah. I, I think it's interesting. A, it's interesting, yeah. Okay, well, let's quickly move on. Dick on. I requested the return of your very ornate macro and undertook to put it back in the place so that the four were now back together again. We spent a lot of today talking about, oh, we don't know where they go when they go back. Mm -hmm. What if they undertake to put it specifically back in that spot? I think it would be very difficult, actually. I mean, one of the points is that these objects are not, uh, the Board of Trustees of the museum has no say in them going back because they're privately owned by the society. So it's actually a question for the board of the society. Uh, but actually, I think uh, I, would, I would certainly argue that it would be very difficult for them to say no on the basis of the documentation we have and the agreement made. It would be a, um, it would actually, yeah, it would undermine the whole loan agreement if you did that. That's, that's how I see it. <laughs> Well, one of the aspects, uh, you mean the one from Chandi Sewu. I mean, what, what, what is interesting about that one is that um, I, I, took a, I took a later photo of, there's a restored version, there's a new macro, uh, but the shape of it is actually quite different. But that's because the whole of, the, uh, the whole of that side of the entrance has collapsed in the past and the stones have been lost. So it's been reconstructed in the 1980s, but the whole facade of that side of the building is new stone. So it would actually be very, it would be difficult, but also, um, yeah, the immediate context is actually gone. So that kind of makes me feel a little bit better, <laughs> uh, but it, it would, it, it, it's not quite as, it's not quite as clear cut an argument as, for, for for returners it would be no well no but i think it's not that's not for it's not for us i mean sometimes i'm asked well you know what would you do if but actually i'm not going to be asked i'm not going to be asked maybe by the society members i might be asked for advice but but it's for the curator it's not our collection. We, we often, curators often speak, oh, my collection. But it isn't. It's actually owned by somebody else. And the people making the decisions for the return are either, in this case, the society board, but also in the case of, of objects belonging to the museum. Actually, it's the Ministry of Culture of the Netherlands 
it's the politicians making those choices. Uh, so all I can do is say, you know, if that was asked, if they were asked that, that back for restoration, specifically for restoration, I would say you can hardly say no. That would be my answer. Thank you. I think we have to move on. Thank you very much, William. <laughs> okay, and so we are um, moving now into the final paper for today. Um, it's gone by very fast, I have to say. Uh, Professor Marika Bloombergen is Professor of Heritage and Postcolonial Studies in Indonesian History at Leiden University. And she's a senior re researcher with the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies, KITLB, in Leiden. Uh, she's a professor in archival and post-colonial oh, studies. It's changed. It's, it's uh, changed. Heritage and post-colonial studies in Indonesian history. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's in the title, in your title. So the first line of the, um, the write-up has changed. Um, and her research interests concern the politics and mobility of knowledge in colonial and post-colonial Indonesia, which she studies through the lens of policing and violence, material culture and heritage practices within inter-Asian and transnational contexts. She published widely on the politics of archaeology, material culture, collecting and exhibi exhibiting in colonial and post-colonial Indonesia. And amongst these, uh, most recently with uh, Martin Eikhoff, The Politics of Heritage in Indonesia, A Cultural History in 2019. So today, the title is From Borobudur with Love, Movable Buddha Heads, Friends of Asian Art and the Moral Geographies of Greater India. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Leslie and Heidi, for, for this invitation. Um, yeah, I think I, I follow up nicely on William's talk uh, and also on some of the questions. Uh, and I'd like to, to start with a story. So around 1900, two ancient stone Buddha heads from Java were leading a dusty life in the country house of a French engineer and local Senate member, Paul de Gouville, who himself normally dwelt in Paris. Then, in April 1910, the two heads became objects of sudden excitement in the minds of their noble beholder. It was their chance to regain public fame. In a letter, the engineer offers, offered them to Émile Guimet, founding director and name giver of the Museum of Asian Art in Paris, here on the picture, with another Buddha head, uh, but it's the Indonesian section. The two heads were to fill in what the engineer perceived to be a gap in Guimet's collection. When visiting the museum's galleries a few days before, the engineer had noticed that it had no heads of Buddha statues on display. Sheer luck that he happened to have uh, two. He offered them to the museum with a discount from 5,000 francs a piece, his calculation, down to 3,000 francs each. Significant in the framework of this workshop, the engineer noted down their provenance. The two heads originated, he claims, from the 8th century ancient Buddhist shrine Borobudur in central Java, and there is a chance they were because it was one of his engineers uh, had, he wrote, selected it at the site of the temple in the 1880s when he was in Java exploring the possibilities for modern intercolonial infrastructural development and expansion. More significant for this presentation, however, it was the new lure, valuation and emphasis of grace and spirituality of ancient Hindu Buddhist objects, uh, now framed as Asian art, with which Musée Guimet proliferated, which triggered him to offer, not necessarily the provenance. This new framing, he realized, added new value and to him potential profit, both in material terms and in status. Even while nothing came of this offer, as far as I've found out until so far, this whole gesture shows how new taxations of ancient Hindu Buddhist objects from Java or elsewhere in Asia were being shaped not only in and by the world of Asian art museums, a new world, but also in a mindset and networks of art collectors and traders. And as I will discuss, why that is a political act. 
In this paper, as promised, I draw on my ongoing research, and now a book project in progress on Indonesia, knowledge networks, not knowledge networks, which include art collectors like this engineer, and the makings of moral geographies of greater India. However, I also use this chance to reflect on the politics and moralities of provenance research as proliferated in recent years by some prestigious museums in Europe. And of what triggered it, the whole the worldwide call for the restitution of objects deriving from formerly colonized countries. And I do so from my, uh, also from my experience as an advisor and participant researcher in the Dutch pilot project provenance research, Ocean. So, provenance. Provenance of museum objects in the narrow sense of origin is not necessarily the most interesting aspect of the social biography of an object. The signification of objects changes when they change owner and move to other places and in their journey through time. In this journey, they become part of heritage politics through transactions at multiple locations. And we have seen many examples of that in the previous presentations. The sum of these transactions is what we call the social biography of an object and what makes this uh, biography political. Therefore, the question of provenance is not the same as asking who is the rightful owner. Also, enough examples of this this day. Whilst for many objects, it is unclear uh, who they should be with, and this question is always political, for some, it is immediately clear, I argue, where they should be. Yeah, oh, now it's going to fall. Yes, thank you. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I went too fast. So this applies, for example, for the, the two images I just showed. I go back, yes. Uh, for the ancient Islamic gravestones from Sumatra and the Borobudur Buddha heads from central Java, now held in depots and showcases in museums of Asian art around the world, including in Indonesian museums. The gravestones belong on the ancient graves in Sumatra. The Buddha heads, to which I will restrict my talk today, belong on the statues of the more than a thousand year old Buddhist temple. In Indonesia, these places, graves and temple, have in turn become part of national and international heritage politics and also changed as a result of local signification. But there, at Borobudur, the Buddha heads could have continued to play a part in local cultural practices, memory creation, and changing signification of that place. Their removal in the context of colonial power structures and disappearance into museum showcases and they pose as spiritual Asian art should be seen as an injustice and epistemic violence. In this paper, I follow a, a number of Buddha heads from Borobudur or said to be from Borobudur to museums elsewhere in the world. They share the same fate with a much larger number of tokens from Borobudur, heads, statues and reliefs carried away in colonial times being kept in these museums worldwide or in private collections. Research into these objects, I argue, requires international coordination and should ideally be conducted on behalf of the temple and the objects, rather than for the diplomatic interests of decolonizing museums, prestigious art schools and universities or research institutes also in the Netherlands or governments. Such research will show how lush their lives can be and reveal stories of love and epistemic violence that transcend the interests of institutes, nations and states. And it should will show their entanglement in the moral geographies of Greater India, the topic of my ongoing research. For that project, I explore how scholarly and spiritual knowledge networks from the Theosophical Society to the Hippie Trail, and including ourselves, enabled the development of what I refer to as moral geographies of Greater India. People's imagination 
of the region that is today, today referred to as South and Southeast Asia as one superior spiritual civilization with Hindu Buddhist characteristics and its origin in India. Significant for the larger problem, these moral ge geographies encapsulate Indonesia, ignoring a predominant Islamic population, the largest of the world. The image of a greater Hindu Buddhist India lingers on worldwide. In popular culture of yoga aficionados and in mov movies, where Indonesia figures again and again as a predominantly Hindu Buddhist country. And relevant for my presentation, today in the world's prestigious museums of Asian art, there we see how Indonesia again and again performs as, as the I should go back actually, as the receiving part of an Indian Hindu Buddhist civilization and is absent in the new uh, galleries of Islamic art popping up everywhere. From the Muse Metropolitan Museum in New York to Musée Guimet in Paris and the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, well choreographed exhibitions strategically use light and space that emphasize the spiritual power and inner, inner beauty of Hindu and Buddhist statues, evoking ideas of greater India. In this way, they obfuscate the violence underlying how objects were collected. So while the idea of greater India has lost appeal to most historians and archeologists of Southeast Asia, and is being countered by Indonesian scholars like Panga Ariansha, emphasizing local agency and the study of local sources, it is still vividly present in Asian art history and museums of Asian art and the wider worlds claiming to be inspired by it. So the question is, why is it still so hard for art historians and curatorial experts of the region to think of Southeast Asia or its sub-region's uh, material remains without starting with India. Today, as a beginning of explaining the dominance of Greater India thinking and as food, food for debate on the question whether and how we can decolonize that multi-centered world, I focus on what I call the charmed knowledge networks and friendships between Asia and the West in the world of museums and trade in Asian art that helped shaping these moral geographies of Greater India. And inspired by the work of Leila Gandhi, I argue that we should focus on the role of love or affections, and thus also greed, across decolonization, if you want to understand the appeal and strength of greater India thinking in that world. So in this light, I explored the social polit political life of some antiquities of Indonesia's Islamic and Hindu Buddhist past, traveling around 1900 from colonial Indonesia to museums and private collections in Europe and the US. Amongst them were some of the heads of the 504 Buddha statues from Borobudur, that Borobudur originally counted. I looked into five that turned up in France just before and in the midst of the high tide of Buddhist art trade. And some of them ended up in Musée Guimet. One, uh, not the one on display here, traveled to the Metropolitan Museum of Art with a rise in market price of around $1,700 within seven years. Their social life provides insight into how changing taxonomies and valuations of the material remains of Asia's Hindu Buddhist past transformed these objects into arts of greater India and vice versa. From around 1910, greater India thinking became pivotal to the inception of a new category of and theorizing on Asian art and the emergence of the Friends of Asian Art Movement and Market. Two theosophists whom art critics were crucial to the to that new appreciation of the Hindu Buddhist material remains for their aesthetic and Indian merits. Ananda Komaraswamy, he has been quoted today, born out of Sri Lankan and English parents, 
who would become the first curator of the Indian section of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And the second one is E.B. Havel, until 1906, superintendent of the Calcutta Government Art School. Both men looked at artistic expressions in Asia under the label of Indian art. Both argued from an India-centered perspective that Asian art should be appreciated as high art in its own right and not as a derivative of Western and that is Greek and Roman standards. Asian art was superior to European art because in their eyes, it showed the Indian artist's capacity to conceptualizing the divine. In Avel's publications, one of Borobudur's Buddha statues from the north side served as a superb example. While this statue was located in Java, maybe uh, the National Museum of Dende of the Batavia's Genootschap, the art is Indian, concluded Havel. The ideas of Havel and Komraswami are still influential in the ways the material remains of the Hindu and Buddhist past of Asia are put on display. Now, in the context of what was an inventive moment and a celebration of greater Indian art, as well as of Asia-based nationalism, from the 1910s onward, cultural and economic elites in Asia, Europe and the US began to engage with new academic and private associational activities while self-identifying as friends of Asian art and friends of Asia, like the VVAK. These associations reflected a globally connected, powerful movement of greater Indian thinking that fed into colonial and intercolonial networks of knowledge. What matters here is that how these associations firmly share the belief that the collection, study and united display of Asian, read Indianized arts, and contemplation of the civilization in which they could flourish would benefit the West and the East. It would be good for both empire and Asian nationalist self-esteem. The friends of Asian art were charmed and connected via their esteem, esteemed modern institutions and associations in the United States, Europe and Asia, and built on the trending theorization of Asian art as art of greater India. And their imagination became useful again after World War II and the formal independence of the formerly colonized countries in Asia. So in the 1950s, the newly independent Republic of Indonesia once again became part and parcel of Art of Greater India exhibits, supported by the uh, Indian embassies in several places in the world. To all indications, for their curators, the categorization remained unproblematic. One such exhibit was held at the Los Angeles County Museum in 1950. Indonesia was represented as Java and exclusively by ancient Buddhist objects from American collections. This exhibition and its catalog are enlightening for how moral geographies of Greater India can become etched in people's minds. The map of Greater India, which framed all objects on display, and the way curator Trubner defended the initiative, trained uh, at Harvard, where um, Komraswami also taught. Today, sincere efforts are being made to bring about closer relations between the East and the West. It is important that we attain knowledge of India's great cultural past and realize the tremendous role that country has played in the history of Eastern art. Far Eastern art. The immediate purpose of the exhibition is to bring about an unbiased and true appreciation of Indian art and this deeper understanding of India's great heritage. So much for the heritage of the other new independent nation states, the borders of which were obfuscated on the map of Greater India and whose people were working at home in parallel on nation building through cultural politics. So like here where President Sukarno in December 1953 inaugurated 
the reconstruction of the 9th century Shiva temple at Pramanan as Indonesia's first national monument. In the country's National Museum in Jakarta, formerly the Museum of Otavian Society, the Hindu Buddhist antiquities there emphatically tell the history of uh, uh, Indonesia, not India. Nonetheless, in museums outside of Indonesia, um, the Hindu Buddhist temple remains from Java still serve narratives of a greater India. So what has love got to do with all of this? The study and collection of Indonesian antiquities by the seekers central in my paper was driven by love, inclusiveness, or motives of peace through cultural understanding. But their search, search also reveals the potential that love has to spawn epistemic violence and appropriation. The friends of Asian art, captivated by Komraswami's and Havel's theories, identified the Indian artist's capacity to visualize the divine in what were, to them, self-familiar images of a meditative man. Through this kind of self-understanding and through their networks, texts and object-based interpretations, sales and exhibitions, the Friends of Asian Art contributed to the global spread of moral geographies of Greater India in the world of art. These moral geographies entailed exclusion, a steadfast blindness regarding Indonesia's predominantly Muslim population, which had so many other pasts to identify with, beyond those of Hindu Buddhist kingdoms, labeled as Indian, Indianized, or Indic. Now, back to Brobedur and provenance research. It is intriguing that from the early 20th century, outside the world of restoration expertise and, uh, and restoration research and development, Many scholars scrutinizing the temple's history and meanings do so by reimagining the temple in the state it was built around 800, thus as a complete unity. They rarely contemplate its missing parts unless in a sense of regrettable loss and decay. Yet ever since its so-called rediscovery in the early 19th century, the missing tokens are just as well a part of the stories Borobudur has to tell. Robador has become more and more incomplete over time, suffering losses in the course of the 19th and 20th century due to the looting of objects belonging to a temple by individuals who saw no problem with that. It is moreover a site of national heritage, world heritage, and global Buddhist commemorative festivals like Vaishak. It is and has been part of the local landscape in which local inhabitants build their own relations with the temple or profit from a local and international tourist industry and politics generated by a World Heritage Site designation. This raises the question to what kind of temple, to what kind of temple would Borobudur Buddha heads return if they do? Perhaps part of the answer lies in the kind of stories people tell each other about the temple's possible meanings to themselves or to others, academically, architecturally, artistically, privately, socially. Examples are the forms of local activism showing various forms of belonging. These include the protests of villagers living around Borobudur who were forced to move from the UNESCO supported restoration project in the 1980s or, or what they call the Ruat Ruat Borobudur, which means um, cleansing rituals, which these villagers have been organizing since 2000, 2003. I end this presentation, however, with another story or actually a poem by the Japanese Roman Catholic activist and poet, Lidens Suriadi, entitled Borobudur. Therein, he reflects on a sacred landscape transformed by tourism and commerce wondering what all of this might entail for Indonesian identity. The point I wanted to make with this poem was originally this. Not only academics study transformation of Borobudur and the, token, the tokens it lost into heritage objects, 
Indonesian poets and activists do so as well. And there are many examples from in the first half of the 19th century, the authors of the Serat Chantini, to the modern Indonesian poets Noto Suroto and Amir Hamza in late colonial times, to Linus Suryadi after the big UNESCO restoration in the 1980s. But literary scholar Taufi Kanafi, who helped me in tracing the original of this uh, English translation, corrected me. And he was right. It is the other way around. Not only Indonesian poets reflect upon Robodur and make us think about its possible meanings, but other poets, academics, artists, and tourists do, and might do so too. Anyone, anywhere. So I'm not sure if I have time to read the poem, but maybe you already read it. You want me to read it? Can I? Yes, I read it. Okay. Hey, I've, yeah, that, that's it. But I think uh, at Borobudur, it is almost incredible. The statues of Buddha are without heads, headless in their places, quiet, imprisoned by the old world. You guess full of anger. Is this a riddle or is it reality? I see only Japanese peddlers, groups of tourists sightseeing. Shops and restaurants are also there. Hotels and markets at the foot of the temple. When it is lush, the Bodhi tree falls with a crash. There is no replacement. There is another version without the centers for shopping and handicrafts. There is another meaning without the reality of the sacred building commercialized, the legacy replaced by arenas for entertainment, a diverse identity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marika. You've given us a really rich uh, presentation there and uh, I'm, my mind is going off in all kinds of directions now. I. I wonder if anybody would like to ask a question at this point. There must be a question in the room. Yes, Peter. Uh, you, um, you really use the word Greater India as the center of, uh, of your talk. And why is that still um, so important in the museum displays? Um, it's true, I think, what you say. Uh, I also think there is more attention now for individual identities. It's not only referring to India in, in a lot of mu museum displays, but what I wanted to ask, how, in what way do you think this is related to the, um, the, the fascination of uh, Europe or the West with the East, the, the more general there's always still that, that, that division between the West and the East. And then the East is often also something beautiful, something religious, something, uh, isn't that also the case here? Um, yeah, that's actually part of, part of the bigger research. So I'm not only looking at the, the art historians, but it is a very telling example because that, but you can also ask the question why, why should we see the, the, this as spiritual objects? Um, and why is that what defines its art? Um, but there is this, yeah, this, uh, this, these ideas about an, uh, an Hindu Buddhist culture that is uh, per definition superior uh, as an, uh, mirrored as against uh, the images of the West as a materialist, uh, war-minded civilization, which had a big appeal, of course, after the First World War. Um, um, and it was not only promoted by uh, people in the West, but by very important figures from India, uh, like Tagore, or the, the intellectuals from the Greater India Society. Um, but there, yeah, you, yeah you, you still encounter it, of course, this, this idea that, that Asia is better. Uh, it's and that like, it's India. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think it's also quite natural for every every human culture to uh, show that uh, the others are different in a way, because you, I, you, you create your own identity by creating uh, the other one as someone different. Mm -hmm. 
that's that's what's often at stake. That doesn't explain why India and Indonesia and Southeast Asia is seen as one. Although for 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 the British, India was the East. For the French, uh, Indochina was the East. For the mm -hmm. for the Dutch, in the Indonesia was the East. And yeah. But still, uh, even in Museo Gimé, where of course uh, Indochina is is the center, but when you follow the the order of the exhibition, there is there is this history of it's it begins in India. And you're right that uh, if you look carefully, you, you see nuances. You see that uh, curators really try to emphasize that there is uh, that these are processes of exchange, that it's reciprocal, um, and, and that they that that, that there there is. It has to do with the structure of of the how how collect, collections are formed uh, uh, and how exhibitions are uh, displayed. So it is also just the order. You begin in India, and slowly you move to the other to further India, as it was called. Um, yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. I I thought that was really interesting. Uh, as much for. Yeah, there's so many aspects to that, but but one is competing nationalisms, <laughs> also and national heritage and and concepts of this. But one, I I wanted to make a remark because in the Rijksmuseum we have, I mean we do exactly what you say. We have Indian, Indonesian, and Cambodian sculptures in one room, um, and actually I never thought of this as being a problem uh, because uh, we're showing okay the collection we have is largely Hindu Buddhist sculpture. That's what we inherited. Um, and it makes sense to, to show it together so you can make comparisons. And, and I think we do that. But I, I never saw it as a problem until uh, I realized that actually um, I was trained in Southeast Asian studies. So Greater India is for me something very kind of, OK, that's what they wrote about in the 20s and 30s. Then it all changed in the 60s to something you know, when you emphasize local local characteristics. So so to me, you can you can make a very interesting debate on this and you can show a comparisons. Um, but actually, one of the problems with that is that you have, uh, yeah, you have a revival of greater India thinking in Hindu nationalism. And so a lot of um, Indian visitors see it completely in a greater India <laughs> perspective. And they're constantly reprinting, you know, the books by Majumda and others who were part of the Great India Society. It's which not a is, revival. This has been always the case in India. Yes, uh, uh, but this is this is a question of um, yeah, it's, it's almost competing nationalisms, and, and one aspect which I think is um, is maybe not emphasised enough is is actually the the Dutch contribution to the debate uh, because actually um scholars such as in particular jc van Leeu and fdk bosch uh wrote very well in basically defending the kind of um yeah indonesian out perspective rather than india in um but it's true that there has been also in scholarship uh, there's been a continued indological emphasis in the study of the objects. So there is an indological bias, and there's reasons for that, uh, partly because of the, um, the access to documentation regarding religion in other cultures, which are easier to, to apply, um, that survive in, in, for example, in Tibet or in China, which don't survive uh, documentation texts that don't survive in Indonesia, but but uh, but yeah, the, there is work to be done on this, and and yeah, we need to think again about how can, how we can display things. Um, yeah. But the thing is also that I mean that, that this, the, the it, um, we are also now all talking about Java in terms of Hindu Buddhist antiquities, um, so the, we reproduce. What is happening uh, in a way? So th there is, th yeah. And I know we we have discussed this before, uh, how to get uh, Islamic objects or whatever. But um, yeah. 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 Yeah.
to grab the microphone and have the last question. Okay. My prerogative, I think. <laughs> I'm very intrigued you chose to put that as your final slide. Now, William oh. Dalrymple. Uh, no, it, just, it was actually, I, it wasn't actually uh, in the middle of my talk, but I thought I skipped it. Just, and, uh, I, okay. uh, because it, uh, I'll forgive you for that. It is one of the, my examples for how, um, how, how, how much it still has appeal, uh, because uh, this is a, a, a review from two blockbuster uh, exhibitions in the Metropolitan. Uh, one of them, Lost Kingdoms, and the other one was uh, Buddhist along the Silk Road. And, and this was what, what he was, uh, how he was reflecting on in the New York Review, so both books. And for me, this is this is uh, a literal. Uh, it's, it's as if he quotes Komarazwani uh, or Havel, uh, and well, uh, this yeah. And the other one example I had, but I definitely cannot. Uh, oh, it's gone. Uh, uh, it's um, Philip Glass' interpretation of the. Um, Countering Buddhism exhibition in the Museum of Asian Art of Smithsonian. I mean, just go on, on the internet and uh, look for how Asian art museums are promoted. Or, um, but he made a concert on the way Asian art has been inspired, and together with the museum, you get this view of this beautiful spiritual Buddha heads. And, um, it, it, yeah, it's it's all all about Buddhism, the, the goodness of Buddhism. Well. That's not necessarily the case that Buddhism is not an uh, uh, unviolent. Uh, I think the religion. point I wanted to make is um, the research I have been doing, um, along with a new book that came out by Peter Sherrick and Andre Akri, was called Creative South. And that actually Java was inspire inspiration for many things. It didn't all come from India. A lot of the work that I've been doing with textile patterns, for any of you who know my book, you know that Indonesians it came from Indonesia and then ended up in Tibet. It didn't all come the other way around. And I think the more and more we need to drum. say that. <laughs> I'm a real yeah. um, advocate for that. And th that was, I'm going to finish with my own words on that. And I think, thank you very much. You did a great job to rounding it up for us. Um, and I want to thank Heidi for rounding this up as well. And I know Ashley is waiting with wonderful notes written up there <laughs> at the end. So I'll pass it back to Heidi and she can finish off. So now I would like to um, welcome uh, Professor, Professor Ashley Thompson to the front um, to, to round up this incredible day. Uh, would you like to sit down and stand up? Okay. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Is this on? Yes? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I don't necessarily have wonderful remarks and I don't have a lot of them, but thank you for thinking that I will. Um, I, I really just wanted to, well, first of all, um, thank you all, the Leslie in the first instance, Heidi, uh, the, the, the team of uh, students uh, on our MA and who perhaps are and the most, uh, the most interested parties. I would, I would expect and I would hope um, here. I also want to thank the speakers, all of you, uh, wherever you all are. Yes, there you are. Uh, thank you very much for your energy and really uh, I think staying, staying the line all the way um, here for a few years as, a, as, a, as it were in the making. We really appreciate it. Um, and I also want to thank the audience members for, um, for making it here today, uh, as well as those people who are online, wherever you are online out there. Um, it's been a very, a very rich day for me. I, I find it somewhat um, unheimlich to use a, a word from a language I do not know. Um, insofar as it was uh, very unfamiliar in some ways, um, going off to Indonesia and going off to, to the Netherlands and to the sort of Germanic regions of, of Europe. Um, that's not that's not the part of Southeast Asia that I am um, most familiar with, and in a way, it. It was something of a, um, well, I'll use a French word here since that's the most, more familiar thing, a dépaysement, a sort of uh, estrangement in a sense to do that. At the same time, it was very familiar. And I, I fear um, in some ways it was very familiar because it's Hindu Buddhist art, as you just um, brought out. 
Um, and there are paradigms that we share um, due to, uh, largely due to colonial knowledge production. And I think that, that makes it very familiar. Um, we've learned it all through the museum displays as well. Um, I think there are also shared questions through um, restitution, for example, that are familiar to me um, in my Cambodia field right now as they really rise to the fore. Um, so I, I appreciate that because it, it spoke to me in uh, interesting ways, thought-provoking ways, um, also because it's from the outside of what I think about um, in most of my time. So I just wanted to, um, I thought it might be useful to uh, just to raise a few questions or to draw out a few questions which you all really expertly raised in your papers. Um, and ways that I think it would be useful um, for us as, as a program, uh, perhaps as a larger collective, I don't know, uh, to take forward, um, perhaps through further collaborative work, perhaps through uh, publications, I don't know, but just questions that, that arose for me in listening to you all today. Um, and they're, they're very unformulated. You saw me sort of typing out a few incoherent words a moment ago. So here they are. Um, the first is uh, the relations between the collective and the individual. It seemed to me that that came up a lot. Um, one way that it came up is that there's a, a sort of uh, collective ownership that you might put on the side of the local um, in thinking about the objects that we've been discussing today uh, versus uh, a sort of paradigm of private ownership that seems to um, that seems to govern uh, processes of restitution, processes of understanding um, uh, what these objects mean today and where they should be. Um, I thought perhaps uh, thinking through more thoroughly what, what, uh, what Marika just uh, drew out, and perhaps I sort of heard this myself and it's not what you were saying, but uh, that perhaps the, the word belonging is more appropriate or more productive in thinking about uh, the place of objects today. So belonging versus ownership or belonging in relationship to ownership, are they, they're not quite the same thing. And maybe thinking through that relationship would be useful for all of us. Um, so uh, yeah, questions of the protection of private property um, being privileged over that of, of collective property. Um, and maybe property again isn't the right word there, but how do we, how does that function in the larger context that we've been looking at? Um, uh, the last talk also made me think about, I, I had noted here violence many, many times in my papers and my notes today, I noted violence. But uh, the last talk made me think maybe we should introduce also the, the word love into how we are thinking about this, but of course, um, an expression of love which can be channeled to violence, um, unfortunately, I think is at least a first step in thinking uh, the expression of love, which is often at work um, in the museumification of objects, in our historical work, um, and so much of what we are all involved with. Um, so that brings me to violence um, associated with the art that we study and certainly associated with the way that we study art. Um, there were questions of real violence. I think that was, that was primarily in Brigitte's talk today, um, but not only. Perhaps it was most in the surface in, in your talk today, the, the, the real violence, um, a, a, a looter, um, being beaten, uh, for example, um, but also I think more, more uh, broadly there were questions of epistemological violence that were at work in a lot of the, the, the talks that we heard today. So things such as how does the categorization of um, antiquities versus ethnographic material, how does that char character, how does that ca categorization impact upon the destiny of materials and their appreciation um, what is the, what are the violences uh, inherent or at least potentially there um, within those processes of categorization and the types of terms that we use? Um, how do terminologies pitting, for example, local looters against European collectors um, who take materials or purchase materials or acquire materials? Um, why does that matter when we use those terms and how can we think productively about our own usage? Uh, a really interesting question I thought arose about what is a fake? Um, you know, when does it become a fake? And how, what does it mean when we call it that? 
Um, and what does it matter if we call something a modern production or a replica um, or a Buddha, period, um, or a fake? What, what, what does it matter? And what are we producing in our own language and our own sort of categorization of that? Um, to be a little bit more frank about things, what does it matter when we call something Hindu Buddhist art? Um, that's a question we think a lot about in this, in this program that is sponsoring um, the symposium today. And it's a question that we experience a lot of um, discomfort with and that we are very open to exploring. Um, and I think that we've also sort of put that on the table too. You all have put that on the table for us in a way that um, we can have a hard time doing it. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, another sort of watchword that came up for me in listening to all of you speak is embodiment. Um, how, do, how do objects regulate social order? Um, we talked about, uh, I think this was in talking about the copper plates. Um, the gods are present in the temple when the objects are present. And that presence of the objects ensures a kind of social order. Um, that seems to me to be quite important and thinking further those questions of embodiment, both on the part of the objects and on the part of people in relationship to the objects is um, something that I think we could, we could spend a little bit more time on together. Um, yeah, I'm almost done. So, right, coffee soon or what is it? Probably not coffee, something better, yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so an, another another uh, point is um, yeah, just thinking this sort of this kind of um, the dichotomies between the local and the the Euro. I want to say Euro American. We didn't really talk about that whole side of the world today, but it's there in my mind. Um, the European um, or what is often put on the side of the universal. Um, we tend to think about living culture. Um, as being on the side of the local um, and about colonial paradigms, certainly our historical paradigms as privileging uh, originality, the original site, the original form um, and authenticity. Um, and there are certainly ways in which this is true, right? Um, in which local cultural practices um, privilege modification, use, reuse, uh, the evolution of objects, the evolution of their meanings. Um, but of course, there are other ways in which local practices are really oriented towards uh, retaining the original and valuing the original. And I think um, I certainly tend to lose sight of that at times. Um, it seems to me, for example, that the very logic of restitution of Southeast Asian states today, um, making a claim to objects coming home is home is premised on that notion of um, the original, of a, of a privileging of the original and of, and of the authentic. Um, so it's not uh, so clear cut that one is on the one side and the other on the other. Um, vice versa, I think it's important to notice or at least to hope that um, academic knowledge does evolve um, and it changes and it is no longer only privileging original meaning. That is art history is no longer only privileging original meaning no matter how um, retrograde art history may appear to be, particularly when it comes to Asian art. Um, there are, for example, modes of art history, um, which I dare say have also infiltrated the museum, um, which interrogate the violences that can be engendered through appreciation of um, beauty or categorization as art. Um, I suppose the last, I was gonna say something about the children of the river, which was such a wonderful um, formulation. Um, and again, in this sort of, I don't know, is it an east-west dichotomy or a local versus uh, universal dichotomy? Um, I tend to spend a lot of time thinking about local terminologies and I tend to think that tells me a lot about local perspectives. Um, I think that's also a, a sort of methodological position that I need to query. Um, so for example, in this term, children of the river, um, which would indicate that they belong to the land or the water in this instance. And so therefore the land belongs to them um, or whatever it coughs up belongs to them. Um, but I do wonder what is the source of that logic? Is, is, there, is it purely local um, or is the local pure or is the local authentic? And is it not also heterogeneous? And we have to sort of consider the heterogeneity of such, um, such an utterance um, or such a sort of self-identification of, of children of the river. Um, 
So I suppose the last thing I will say is, uh, again, in thinking about the ways that we might pursue some of the questions here in challenging uh, established dichotomies between the local and the European or the colonial or the Euro-American or the universal, um, the ritual versus the academic even, um, is something like this. It, it seems to me that we're, we are fairly aware of, and this is something we do a lot with the students, right? We're, we're fairly, so, so I and a number of colleagues um, take our Southeast Asian, we have a bunch of Southeast Asian bursary students, you all may know this, um, working on postgraduate programs. And we, we for, since 2014, we've spent um, uh, a week long field trip every year visiting uh, archives and museum collections and research archives in Paris uh, for the French colonial uh, materials uh, and in, um, in the Netherlands for the Dutch colonial um, archives. And during that, over the, over the course of those trips, there's, there's a stark difference that comes out to all of us, I think, um, between a, a, a Dutch, um, I'm being very reductive here, but let me do it. Uh, a, a Dutch approach to thinking the colonial past, which is evidenced in a uh, museum display and in archival organizations and in presentation of those materials to us, and a French, uh, a French approach to, shall I say, not thinking the colonial past uh, in the context of museum display, et cetera. Um, again, that's very reductive on both sides, but there's, there's a stark contrast. I was saying to someone a moment ago that I think that contrast is actually really changing with uh, French governmental initiatives under Macron, et cetera, regarding restitution. I think that is evolving, but so far it's still pretty pretty steady. So I think that we're, we've become fairly accustomed to seeing the impact of the different colonial contexts on object interpretation, on knowledge production around, around objects and um, how that is impacting restitution issues today. What we're less attentive to, or what is more difficult to feel out and to grasp is the, the other the sort of other side of the medallion, uh, which would be the, the kind of uh, specificities, the, the local specificities within Southeast Asian contexts that are themselves impacting um, object, uh, object interpretation, knowledge production, and uh, therefore the restitution context today. I think that's harder to see um, also because of the Hindu Buddhist paradigm that we sort of put it all under one paradigm and it's harder to see what are the specificities going on around Borobudur since the 17th century and people are writing about, you know, Borobudur as a refuge. What are the specificities around, um, around Angkor Wat or around Koke? What, what are the specificities going on in a very local context that make us understand things differently in those different contexts and make us understand uh, the make the restitution processes different in each place. It's not just an effect of the colonial past is what I'm trying to say. It's also an effect of things on the ground. And it seems to me that's what we that's one of the major tasks that we have now is to really feel out um, specificities and differences on, on, on the ground underneath and melded with what we call Hindu Buddhist art. So, um, uh, and so one way of saying that is let's think about the heterogeneity of the local rather than using that term that I keep using called the local, right? So all in there. Thank you all very much. It's been wonderful to have you. And we have now, um, I think a reception and I'll turn it over to Heidi and to Leslie to tell us about that.